All right, welcome back, everyone. We're going to kick off today with a graph modeling question. I like threw these at you at the end of lecture on Monday really fast. I don't expect you to be super great at them. But read through this scenario, talk to the, your wonderful community, and think about how you would translate this human-ish situation into a graph model by answering these questions. And the poll everywhere should be live. Go ahead and take four minutes. Let's talk about it. <clears throat> Sorry, still getting over this chest cold thing. Um, okay, so first off, I will say there's probably multiple correct answers to this. Don't we love that in STEM classes? It's our favorite. Um, I also have only really shown you some of the ways to model graphs so far, but I haven't really told you yet what to do with those models. We're gonna talk about that all today. And a lot of these things become simpler when you kind of know, oh, this is the algorithm that's gonna give me the question I'm trying to answer. So I gotta make sure my model has these pieces in it. So it'll get a little less ambiguous, but I think it's fun. So, <laughs> Um, you are representing a brand new social media network. You have profiles and you have two different types of connections. You can have friends, where it's a mutual connection, and you can have follows, where it's a, we'll call it unrequited 
connection. Um, so, like I said, there's probably multiple different ways to do this, uh, but I'm guessing we all probably have similar answers for the first option. So, what are the vertices? And to remind you of the vocabulary, that's like the node looking thing in the graph. That's usually represented by a circle or a square. It's got a piece of data in it. What are the vertices? Can anyone raise their hand and tell me what the vertices are in their design? Yeah, sure. People, People yep. Profiles, something like that. That entity that is triggering the relationship, okay? So then what are the edges? Those are the arrows between or the lines between. Anyone know what the relationships, the edges are going to be in this one? Yes. So again, the edges are how the different vertices relate to each other. And in this way, we have a couple different types of relationships. So we know that these edges are going to represent both friendships and following. Now, I'm not going to lie. This is a little bit of a tricky question. I know I make the warm-ups tricky because I try not to give you trick questions on the exam. I just want to be annoying in lecture. Um, but a lot of people might look at this and be like, oh, well, a follow, since that's sort of a one directional relationship, would we make that a directed or undirected edge? Anyone? Yeah. Directed. Directed. So if I went and followed my favorite musical artist on Twitter or something like that, you would have an arrow that leaves from my profile and ends on their profile. It's a one directional thing. But the friendships are bi-directional, right? Like they kind of have this mutual nature to them. And if you don't have the arrow on one end of that edge, it means that that connection is always bi-directional. But here's the trick. You can't co-mingle. Your entire graph has to be entirely directed or entirely undirected. So if we have a relationship like follows that always has to be directed, how could we represent a mutual relationship knowing that every edge then has to be directed? Yeah, I like that. I, I agree. I like this, this hand gesture. It's two arrows pointing, sort of like parallel, pointing from one and back to the other. Now, the last question is weighted or unweighted? Now, weighted means that there is a value associated with the edges, because again, we're just making things more complicated. So now, instead of an arrow just telling you how to get from one node to the other, it could store its own information in it. In fact, it could be its own object. It could store as much information in there as you want. Um, did anybody talk about any types of data you might want to store on these edges? Anyone come up with anything? This is the one that I think is probably the most ambiguous in this question. Yeah, please. Yes. So one thing you could store on these edges is maybe any edge leaving a particular profile is weighted with that profile's followers. Like, let's be real. If suddenly Beyonce started following me, that follow means a lot more than my mom. Sorry, mom, right? And so maybe we would use their follower count as a weight. And this is actually how we do graphs of social media influence, usually by that kind of thing. You can also do different types of weights that might help you get a better sense of what the influence from those connections come from. But there's other ways. Yeah. Ooh. The date is a great one, too. And you're right, because the date's really associated with that edge, because it's like the moment you hit the follow button. And that's in the relationship, not in the profile. So I think date makes total sense. And in fact, we're going to learn an algorithm today that could even run across your map and then tell you how you ordered all of those things. I don't know if there's any other interesting conversations out there that anybody wants to. I think that was, oh, look at me. I even independently did those. Great. I, I picked unweighted just. Because I was like, oh, yeah, maybe that's an... And then I drew a graph that was weighted, because why not just screw with you on the, the slides? Um, but there you go. There's maybe a possible representation. Yeah? Is whether an edge is weighted or unweighted open to interpretation? 
So whether an edge is weighted or unweighted is open to your interpretation of the situation, but will be implemented in the code. So it's up to you whether you think you want to store the influence or the date or something like that, depending on what you need. I will tell you it probably in the future will be dictated by the algorithm because a lot of the algorithms take into account the edge weight. For example, if Google Maps is a big graph, you maybe store the distance or the time it takes to drive on each of the edges, and then there's an algorithm that can tell you how to get from one node to the other as fast as possible, that kind of thing. Any other thoughts or questions on this initial problem here? Boop. OK, the announcements are really boring for today, because I kind of hope that you know what's out and due. So exercise three was due yesterday. Uh, P3 will be due not this Thursday, but next Thursday. Why? Because on Friday, we're going to return your midterm grades for you, and then you'll have another assignment to resubmit the midterm. Yes, P3 is a one-week assignment, but we're giving you two weeks, because that's a lot of deadlines all in one time. Does anybody have any administrative questions at all at this moment? Let's do more. OK, so um, we've talked about graphs representing physical traveling. We've talked about graphs representing interactions or relationships between entities. Graphs can also sort of represent state. Um, this is the classic state example. I don't know why computer scientists are obsessed with traffic lights. Maybe there's something somewhat universal about it. We love it. We love the traffic light. But in this particular, also, if you can't tell from my very annoying project and process, I'm Canadian. And so American traffic lights, they have only three states, red light, yellow light, green light. In Canada, we have flashing green, which is a whole different state. Um, but the way traffic lights work, I think, is that they only can transition from one light to the other in a specific order. And in this case, we are going to assume that order is dictated by timers. We've all been stuck at a light that's based on a timer. We're going to save all of the different ways that maybe interact with the light from like pushing the pedestrian button or the weights on the um, surface of the road or something like that. So let's say you are mapping an American traffic light that is just based on a timer. What do we think we would make? the vertices in this particular case to represent this? What is the entities that are then going to be interacted with in between? Does anyone have any ideas what the entity is in this state? Yeah, sure. The different lights, the different lights exactly. And you can think of that as the state of the traffic light. So state one, maybe that's the green light. We would have a node for that. And then the edges will be how you move from that green light to the red light. That's the order, right? No, yellow light. See? I swear I can drive <laughs> sometimes. Um, so we would go from green light to yellow light and then eventually to red light, right? So we would maybe have however long the green light's supposed to stay lit, and that would be the weight on the edge that goes from the green light to the yellow light. Now, because there is a specific order, unlike I just got confused, you aren't supposed to be able to go directly from green light to red light, right? Like you're supposed to have that yellow light in the middle. So we are going to have a directed nature to these transitions between state. And then again, the weights, maybe that's the time. There we go. And in fact, there, I even drew us a little picture. Maybe that's how we transition through the traffic light. So wait, graphs can also represent state change. Does anyone have any questions on this sort of idea? Well, let's do another one. OK, um, this is another, I think, somewhat failed midterm uh, question at some point. Um, you're going to a music festival, and you're trying to plan the perfect schedule for you. You're planning your state. And you want to catch all of your favorite artists. You know which time each act starts, how long it will be. You can only get into that act if you get there before it starts. You can only leave after it ends. 
how are you going to draw up a graph that represents all the different possible ways you can navigate this music festival to optimize for your favorite artists? Why don't you actually take a couple minutes, take two minutes, discuss this. What are your vertices? What are your edges? What are the transitions? All right, I know that probably wasn't enough time to talk about it, but I hope that in your conversation there was something like, I don't know, there's not enough information, or maybe you all made a bunch of different assumptions, because I think this one there's a lot of different solutions for. So I've got like my solution on here, but you could probably convince me of a lot of different things. So does anyone um, brave want to raise their hand and tell us a little bit about what they talked about? Maybe what are your vertices at least in your design? How would we start to model this? Thank you so much. Yeah. Sure. So maybe the artists are themselves the individual vertices, because that's kind of like the individual state, like you standing in front of the stage watching that artist. And what we really need to figure out is like an ordering of how you're going to move from one artist to another artist kind of thing. Um, anyone have anything different than artists or the vertices? Like I said, I think there's, there's probably multiple ways to go about this one. So just curious if anyone had any other different creative approaches. Yeah. You talked about like the location of the artifacts. Mm. So if you're at a festival, there's probably multiple locations. Yeah. So the stages could be the vertices. See, that's what I was thinking about too. Like maybe, yeah, the different vertices are the stages. And then maybe something like in that case, the edges are like the transitions between artists or something like that. Like the way, it's, you know, there's a lot of different ways to go about this. But that's another one I think would work too. Yeah. set times, which also kind of works in the same idea of the stage. If the stage is your physical location, maybe the set time is like, maybe, you know, there's like a bunch of acts at three, and then there's a, everybody has the same kind of transition time, and there's a bunch of acts at four. That sometimes festivals do it that way too. So I think the same thing, maybe like the three o'clock show time or something could be its own vertex kind of thing. Um, I did it for context. I did it in terms of artists. Um, I think that might be the one that initially comes to our minds. And then maybe the edges are based on the possible next choice. And so I do think it is directed because you can't just, there's something about the progression of time, right? You can't start in the morning with the headliner and then go back around to something else. So I think there's some concept of directed. I'm moving from one stage or one time period or one artist to the future one. So I think we're hopefully at least kind of aligned on the directed. And then the weighted, this is another one where I think there's a bunch of different answers to this. Um, did anybody have any, what type of information would they put on their edges, anything anyone talked about that was interesting in this case? Yeah, sure. Maybe like a scale of how much you like the artist. Ooh, I like that, a scale. Yeah, maybe you like rate all of your things and you give a bigger scaling to the artist you really want to see and we'll see some algorithms where that would help you find the one you like best. Yeah.
Excellent point. Maybe it's like the time to get there or like how busy that crowded area is or like, I don't know, can you like leave and get a snack and come back? I don't know. Whatever works for you. But it's something about the transition maybe in the physicality of how you get from one artist to the other. Maybe it's how they change over their stage, things like that. Yeah. Exactly. And you're absolutely right. Very similar. It's like distance you walked. Maybe you're like, I cannot go any further in this festival outfit. Whatever works for you. It's hot outside. I don't know where your festival experiences are. Um, but I think all of these, you know, work. Here's mine where I sort of stored all the information in the vertices. And then I just did unweighted based on who comes after the other one. But I think all of those conversations that you're having all really valid, you know, um, and I did it in this way because, again, I'm going to show you a specific algorithm so you can solve it when it's in this model. Any questions about that? Yeah. So since there are many correct answers, how do you determine if like, someone's approach is rapidly correct? Ah, since there's so many right answers, how do you know what's right or not right? Um, so the way that we're going to present these problems to you in your exercises, in your section, and then eventually on the assessment, because surprise, there will be graphs on the assessment. Um, is we're going to give you a little scenario like this. We're probably going to ask you these questions. And then there's going to be some questions following that are like, what algorithm would you run in order to answer this question? And there are requirements of the graph. So some algorithms only work if it's directed. Some algorithms only work if it's weighted. Some algorithms, the way that the question will be answered, it's in how you organize the graph. So we will always give you full credit as long as you can answer the question. But that's how we know, is if you got some sort of viable answer via the algorithm that you picked. Yeah? Uh, should there also be an arrow from Dua Lipa to Beyonce? I agree. There should be an arrow from Dua Lipa to Beyonce. Maybe you take a break. You would be making a mistake, but you could. I absolutely agree. There could be an arrow there, too. And so maybe the arrows in this case represent possibility. And you know, maybe Beyonce is obviously the headliner, so there's no arrows from her to anywhere else. Kind of. Any other questions? Cool. OK, great. So let's talk about some of these algorithms I keep referencing. So graphs are kind of weird, right? Like I know the first time maybe we met linked lists, and maybe the first time we met trees, it's not super clear how to write code, how to navigate them. So I'm going to walk you through a few different bits of code and hope that like you kind of pick up an understanding of it along the way. But I'm going to tell you right now, the code that I am showing you by the end of this lecture and then the code we're going to spend all of Friday on is the code I'm going to ask you to implement in P4. I say this every quarter and then I give you the pseudocode and I say you could just take the pseudocode and translate it line by line for the assignment. But it's still a really hard assignment, so we'll get through it together. Um, okay. How do we motivate this? Let's say we have a graph, and the graph looks like this, where we have a bunch of different nodes with numbers in them, and they have some undirected, unweighted edges. And we just want to know if there exists a path that connects the node labeled S for source to the node labeled T for terminus. Now remember, graphs are just a collection, a set of vertices. They don't have to all be connected to one another. So we can't just assume that you can always get from every node to every other node. So maybe we need one to actually determine, can you get from Dua Lipa to Beyonce, for example? So we could use recursion where we just actually kind of crawl our way through the graph, where we start at the source vertex, and then we say, OK, Let's see all the neighbors of source that I can go to. And then I'll look at all of my neighbor's neighbors. And then I'll look at all of my neighbor's neighbor's neighbors and my neighbor's 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 neighbors and so on and so forth. Here is some code that could maybe do that. So we take in our source. We take in our terminus. First, we check, are they the same? Because if they're the same, then they're definitely connected. We've done it. Otherwise, we loop over all of the neighbors for our given vertex, which the first iteration through will be source. And if that neighbor is directly connected to the terminus, then I finally return true. So if I'm starting here with S, I would loop over all of S's neighbors, which would be 1. And I'd ask, is 1 connected to the terminus? 
It's not, so I'm going to loop around. Now, in this particular code, I'm going to get stuck because I'm going to loop around and I don't have a way to essentially mark that neighbor is visited and move along to the next neighbor. So we are going to need to add a collection that's going to track our progress as we move through the graph. And this is actually a really core idea of any graph algorithm that we're going to need a lot of collections as we go along. You are going to find that graphs are just big data structures filled with a lot of data structures inside. It's part of why they're so popular in interview questions these days. So we are going to create a separate storage. We're going to make it a set of vertices. We're going to call it visited. And so we are going to mark something as visited at the moment we're ready to start exploring our neighbors. So I kind of like to think of myself as like, I don't know, are you like an island hopper or maybe something where you're sort of like Mario jumping on top of different platforms, whatever works in your head, but we've jumped on top of source. We put all of our, we loop through all of our neighbors. If the neighbors does not contain the thing, we check if it's connected and we return true. Otherwise, we have now added source we can move on and move on to our neighbors and neighbors and neighbors. This is what we refer to as depth first search or DFS. And the reason it is called depth first search is because the recursion is going to cause us to constantly interrupt our exploration of neighbors. So if I originally had multiple neighbors of source, I would look at my first neighbor, and then before I return to any of my other immediate neighbors, I would then look at my neighbor's neighbor, and then that neighbor's neighbor's neighbor first, and do that sort of like rabbit hole down everyone's first neighbors before I came back and looked at any of my other neighbors. Now this is recursive code. I show you this recursive code because a lot of people see trees and they see graphs and they seem similar and so their brains are like, oh, a recursive nature makes sense. Even in the language for it, neighbors of neighbors is kind of a recursive sentence. But we don't actually program it very often with recursion, mostly because hopefully you know at this point recursion is actually pretty inefficient because it runs in that exponential time. So we are actually going to move away from this approach now. There we go. Great. Okay. Oh, and look at I even put in a little animation. That's the order I would visit things in before I come back around to visit my other neighbors. Thank you, pass Casey. Um, this does technically work on trees, that's like I said, but here's what I think is helpful. No, wait, come on. Yes, that is the order in which you will visit the node. See how I kind of went from the overall route down deeply down one path of the tree first until I got all the way to a leaf node. And then afterwards, I came back around and dealt with the other neighbors. That's where the D, the depth, comes from in the name of this algorithm. I'm going to show you why I'm spending so much time clarifying why the depth part of this matters. But this is all about exploring the first neighbor I see, and then the first neighbor of the neighbor I see, and then the first neighbor of the neighbor's neighbor I see, so on and so forth. Great, great. Welcome to the other style of graph traversal, breadth-first search. If you like analogies, it's not dissimilar to in the tree traversal category of pre-in post-order traversal, where they all visit all the nodes. It's just about the order in which they visit them. That's what BFS and DFS is. They are just two algorithms that both accomplish the same thing of visiting all of the connected nodes. They just do it in a slightly different order. Yes, there are some scenarios where the order will matter but it will be because I put some tricky sentence into the midterm about specifically the order making some particular difference. But overall, if you let either of these algorithms just run to completion, all they do is they kind of crawl through the graph. They respect the connections that exist within the graph, so they will determine connectivity. 
So for example, if you have one of those nodes that's just like not connected to anything or is some reason unreachable, it will not be touched in this algorithm, which is exactly what we're looking for, just crawling its way using the actual um, existing references. So, yeah, great. This one, again, we're moving from source to target. We're going to start with source. And instead of looking at the first neighbor and then that neighbor's neighbor and so on and so forth, I'm going to kind of go in what I like to think of as rungs, sort of rings outward from the initial source. So I'm going to start at source. I'm going to explore all of source's immediate neighbors. And then I will explore all of my immediate neighbor's neighbors and so on and so forth. Uh, back in 2020, I thought it was so cute, and I wrote a whole midterm question about, like, if you got COVID and your roommate got COVID, how many orders of rungs of relationships removed are you from a COVID case? I think that was probably ill-timed. Sorry, students. Um, but now it's stuck in my head. I think this sort of rungs. Also, if you're familiar with that problem, six degrees of Kevin Bacon, Kind of similar idea. This is a way for us to start to think about the degrees of removal from one node to another. Layer by layer, there we go. So you can even see the order of the layers in which we're evaluating things. But I showed you how to do that recursion one. And the recursion one works really naturally because recursion, right, as soon as we call myself, I interrupt and I start a new method call and I sort of supplant my process, right? So how do we translate this sort of like rung nature into code? Well, instead of using recursion, we are going to use iteration. Let's take a look. So here's our BFS code. We are going to take in a graph object at this time, and we're going to take in a start vertex. Then we are going to create a data structure in addition to the visited structure, we need another structure that's going to tell us the order in which to visit the neighbors I'm aware of but not have not yet visited. So if I start on source, source is my first visited node, I'm going to take all of its immediate neighbors and put it into the queue in order. I still have my visited set. I kind of picked that up from before. I add start. Start. Um, source gets added to both of them initially, and then we are going to loop while perimeter, or you could think of that as like neighbors to explore, still has items in it. We're going to pull out the first neighbor. We're going to look over all of that neighbor's edges, and then we're going to see if there's anything left to explore. Let's look at an animation. So I'm going to start at one. One initially goes into perimeter because I need something to enter this while loop. So I'm going to add one to the perimeter so I can pass that first if check. Then the very first line inside the while loop is to remove that item, which makes sense. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to loop over each edge, whoops, and I'm going to add each of the neighbors at the end of each edge. So the neighbors of one are two and four, and I add them into the queue in that order. I check that they're not visited. I add each of them. And then I start to add each of their immediate neighbors, so on and so forth. And so the queue helps us make sure that we address all of my immediate neighbors in this rung before I move on to the neighbors of my neighbor. So the queue makes sure that my process is never interrupted. So this gives me the breadth of handling all of my neighbors as opposed to the recursion depth interruption sort of technique. And in fact, this code that I'm showing you right here actually becomes the foundation for almost every other piece of graph algorithmic code we're going to write from here. Because most graph algorithms are about moving through the graph. From here on out, we're just going to start to add tricky little if statements where they make intelligent decisions about where we go or how we weight the decisions, things like that. But this is sort of the base code that lets you just travel through the whole graph, and you can adapt it from there. I'll show you how. 
Any questions so far? Yes. Are the terms open list and closed list, I heard that in a different class. Are those real terms, or are they kind of just used in that class? I'm not familiar with them off the top of my head. So maybe that was a way to explain something I would understand if I knew the context. But I do the same thing in my class, so I get it. <laughs> Any other questions? OK, there we go. Finish it. You can play around with the animations in your own time. <clears throat> so um, yes, why does it work? Again, looking at the sort of rungs, the queue is maintaining the order in which we navigate through the vertices that we make sure that we're not interrupting our progress of exploring my immediate neighbors. Anytime I hear of a new neighbor, they get into the back of the line. Their time will come. First in, first out. Well, so now we have our BFS code. And I showed you the recursive DFS code. But I used a queue to maintain the order in which I visited neighbors. Can we think of a different structure that I could replace the queue with that would give us back that sort of interrupting, I'm going to do my neighbor's neighbor and then my neighbor's neighbor's neighbor first type of structure? If all I had to do was just change this one structure to something similar, but it changes the order in which I handle things as they come to me. Instead of first in, first out, maybe I want a structure. Yes, thank you. A stack. Yes, exactly. Boom. There we have a stack. So BFS and DFS, both of these codes work the same. They will visit all of the nodes. If you want the breadth first style, Use a queue to handle the order in which the neighbors are visited. If you want DFS, you use a stack. Just changing the order of the neighbors. Questions? Maybe? Cool. OK. Ready for another graph algorithm then? Yes, great. OK, thank you. Yes, all right, Casey, we get it. Jesus, OK. Um, so yeah, so this is most of the, um, like I said, the sort of foundation for the way that you're going to just code how to navigate through graphs, BFS and DFS. This is sort of your like equivalent of a for loop over an array. This is how we got to navigate them. Okay. Um, yeah, and you could use the recursion one, but like I said, recursion is really inefficient, so it better be on a small graph. Great. Okay, yes. So here is the BFS um, code with the S to T connectivity problem. All we did is we added an if statement and an extra parameter so that we know when we finally found the particular vertex that we're looking for. Because previously, without these highlighted changes, all this code does was just start at some given vertex and just navigate to all the other ones. So if I want to tell if this vertex is connected to another one, then all I have to do is add an if statement that's like, well, I'm navigating to all the other ones. If I hit that one, return true, bail out. Otherwise, if I never hit it, return false. I traveled all the way through the graph, and I never encountered it. So this is, again, an example of how maybe this is a foundational code that you can adapt for your specific problem. Great. Oh, yes, please. Could you recompute the traversal for, oh, and then like look in a hash map and see if like t showed up in it or something like that? Oh, yeah, if you wanted to do that so you don't have to constantly retraverse it, yeah. But in this particular case, let's say I just wanted to know on the first time through whether I was going to hit T at any point. That's how we would do it. But yeah, you could theoretically do it once and save it. Also, if you couldn't tell from this, I was making some kind of arbitrary decisions about the order within a single layer of neighbors. Like I was kind of picking my, labor, my neighbor to my left is the first one into the queue, that kind of thing. So there actually are multiple valid orderings 
for BFS or DFS based on which immediate neighbor you pick over the other ones on an exam, we will make it unambiguous, usually by telling you to order the neighbors in alphabetical order or something like that. But just so you are aware, there are multiple correct orderings of BFS and DFS. Another algorithm. Okay, honestly, this algorithm I think is really important and I just, I've tried it in like 90 different places in these series of lectures and I still haven't found the ideal spot for it. So I'm sorry if it kind of seems a little bit of an aside. Um, but topological sort is an algorithm that you can apply to a directed acyclic graph. If you notice on BFS or DFS, didn't matter if it was directed, didn't matter if it was weighted, didn't matter if it had cycles. Now I'm starting to put limitations on the type of graph you can apply this algorithm to. So topological sort only works with directed edges, and it only works if it's acyclic, which means there can't be a cycle anywhere in it. And because what we're going to do is, is we are going to try to create a linear ordering of the graph that respects that, those directed edges. Um, sometimes you can kind of think of this as a, quote, dependency graph, and that is actually part of why we use this algorithm. When you ask your computer to go build your code, it has to go look at all of your import statements and all of your usage and things like that, and it has to build a file before it's used, so it actually creates a graph and runs topological sort so it can figure out the order in which to build those files. Um, so yeah, there's lots of applications. So here, for example, topological sort, maybe this is our original graph with the original edges, but the topological sort would be able to run and tell us that the ordering of this would be ABC. What is a directed acyclic graph? Um, it just means that there can't be any cycles. If you can think about this sort of dependency thing, you couldn't have a circular dependency because that just will break the way things work, right? Like, if I told you that you had to have work experience to get work experience, you're like, that's crazy and doesn't make sense. That's a cycle that breaks that sorting, right? That's why you can't have a cycle in the topological sort. So let's um, talk about how to actually run this algorithm. So here I have a DAG, a directed acyclic graph. And what we are going to do is we are going to start with the node with the smallest in degree and work our way from the smallest in degree forward based on the assumptions. So here are the in degrees of each of these nodes. So nothing points to A. So A has no previous dependencies. C, D, and E each have one incoming arrow. So they ha each have one previous dependency. And then B happens to have two. And we're going to work our way from smallest number of dependencies to most. So because A has nothing that comes before it, I can make A the start of the ordering. And then what I'm going to do is it's like I'm going to kind of like pretend A goes away, and I'm going to update the in degrees. And I'm going to now ask myself which one of these nodes has the smallest in degree it happens to be the letter C. So C can come next, and then I remove C. And then now all of these have the same in degree, which means the order of these three doesn't matter. As long as those three all come after A and after C. Questions on how I worked my way through the graph there? I think I may have time to let you do this. Great. You get to practice. Let's say I've given you a bunch of courses that are represented as vertices, but they have prerequisites. And the prerequisites are represented by directed edges. 
run a topological sort algorithm to tell me a linear ordering of the classes that you can take. And we have time. Go ahead. Take three minutes. Discuss it with those around you. It's been a few minutes. Let's chat about it. Okay, so again, we start with in degrees. What classes on this list have an in degree of zero? So they could be the first class. There are a few right answers. Yes, please. Uh, math 126 and CSE 102. I know those classes have prerequisites. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> unless, I don't know, AP credit or something? Uh, but yes, you are absolutely correct according to our DAG. Those are the classes. It doesn't matter which one comes first, but we know those two have to be at the beginning of our ordering. There we go. Okay, I just didn't break it up. Um, then, from there, when we remove each of those items, which class must come next? Which one then has the next smallest number of in degree once we remove the Math 126 and the CSE 122? Yeah. CSE 123, which makes sense. And yes, maybe I tried to like put this a little bit in order to make it easy for your eyes. So hopefully this kind of makes sense. Then we remove CSE 123. What comes after that? What has the fewest number of in degrees after we remove 123 and its connections? next in your ordering. There are multiple correct answers to this one. Yeah. CFC 373. CFC 373. Absolutely. The other correct one, which would have totally been fine, CSE 374. And then finally, we'll finish with CSE 417. So here's an order, but I left the arrows in there for reference. Any questions on how that algorithm works? Yes. Yes, the in degree means how many arrows land or end on that particular node. So CSE 123 has an in degree of two, CSE 374 has an in degree of one, Math 126 has an in degree of zero. Yeah? I don't know if this really matters, but are both 126 and 122 required, or can you just require? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think in this particular one, the way that it would be interpreted is that both are required for that course. If it was either one, I guess this would still technically, like the top, this topological sort would matter as well. I think in this particular output, you're just taking all of these classes, so you're trying to do it. But it's a good question. Cool. All right, we'll leave it there. Go to section tomorrow because I promise you need practice with these problems. And then come back on Friday for the algorithm to rule them all. Dijkstra's. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, thank you. Oh, yes. 
The wonderful TA is here to remind me that there is a social hour starting right now, and you can all walk together to the Siesta building. Yes, yes thank you. I think we're going to be talking about technical careers. Technical career social hour. Like Hangout. Resume, resume workshop. Yes. Aria is here. I assume, Aria, you're going to yeah. rest. Aria will help walk with you if you want to come to social hour. Thank you for the reminder. Mm. I saw, I did see your email in passing. Um, how are things going? Just getting down. The class really got rough. Oh, I get that. Okay, perfect. That's why I was like, because I almost started, I was like, you don't have to rush. Just pick a day that you're like, yeah, I feel confident by that, and then I'll just go in and update it so you can. Yeah. We'll try to talk to today. Okay. Yeah, there should be. Okay. Perfect. Even now, the last one won't work because I don't know what's happening. It's like oh. three of them will work, and then the last one, it's probably because like, I'm like deleting a whole part. Uh. If you like, if you can't finish a part and delete, like, like self comment out. Yeah. Does it make it so that it doesn't work because it's testing it? Yeah. Yeah, that's the problem. Interesting. Okay. I'm taking on like um, one of the math problems. Oh. Like, yeah. Well, there, yeah, that definitely, a TA should be able to at least help walk through some debugging with you, and I, I know there's some office hours still today, so, yeah, perfect. Okay, great, I'll keep an eye out for you now. Perfect. Hi. Hi, how are you? Yeah. I'm good. I'm glad. Uh-huh. Oh, cool, yeah. So, after this class, so I want to take, like, operating systems and distribution systems, but I have to take 351 for that, I have to take uh. 351, I have to take 333, uh. and 332, but this kid started for 332, yes. so does it count? So, if you were going to get into the major, I yeah. think they make you retake it, but if you're not going to get into the major and you're just trying to um, petition into the majors only courses, yeah. they should give you credit for it. Okay, Yeah. Because gotcha. the difference is parallelism, but there isn't really parallelism in the mm -hmm. courses you're trying to take, so. Yeah. 